You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle or me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is David Benner. David's been involved in journalism for most of his career, but he Took a bit of a break a few years ago, more than 25 years ago, and has served as Director of Media Relations for the Indiana Pacers, in which role he serves as primary contact between the media and the team. David, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. Can I get some Girl Scout cookies? You certainly can get some Girl Scout cookies. Do you oh. want to just email me your uh, order? Oh, no problem. I'll be happy to, because I missed out this year. My main contact, her daughter got too old for her for cookies. Well, so you know, uh, m- uh, Mr. Jim Morris's wife and Mr. Morris, of course, uh, Jackie, they're very involved in the Girl Scouts. So you have you have the connection much higher up on the food chain than I am. No, you're going to be my connection. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having uh, spending some time with us today. We've had. Uh, your brother Bill on a few times in various roles, and I've been trying to get you on for a long time because of your career. Uh, you've done so many cool things. You've witnessed so many amazing things, and we're grateful for your time. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you are Hoosier, born and bred. Correct. Uh, how much? Uh, you went to Center Grove High School, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. And where did you go to college? Uh, Indiana. And you graduated from IU in? The 78, 79, something like that. I can't even remember anymore. I'm old. You got to remember that. I'm old. I forget the name. Just ask my well, wife. <laughs> we're going to ask you about the uh, uh, incredibly uh, sharp PR uh, maven, as we know her, Ms. Jankowski, and how she's been helpful to you because uh, she's one of the best in the business, incredibly respected. Uh, but what was it like? The reason I asked you about where you went to college and when you graduated was because you were there for the 76 undefeated team. Uh, you went 32 and 0. What was it like being on campus for that experience? Well, uh, let's see. What can I say and what can't I say? Um, it, it was it was a tremendous experience. There's no question about that. And to be part of a, as a student and a fan of a, seems like a once in a lifetime feat of going undefeated, winning the national championship and that type of thing. I did end up in the fountain that night at one point. (laughs) And it was, uh, I lived in right, I lived in right quad in the dorm. We all sat around and like we had three different rooms uh, the third floor of right quad and watched the game. And then when we won, of course, everybody adjourned to the streets and started celebrating. It was it was a great it was it was a great moment. And I, you know, like my brother, I look forward to the day that IU football can accomplish the same thing, and I may go back to Bloomington and jump in the fountain again. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, they've got the coach for it. That's for sure. Finally, after years of searching, we've had Fred Glass on. He's talked a little bit about IU athletics. Uh, and the one th- other thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, I got a few questions, actually. Um, were you there when they were filming Breaking Away? Yeah. What year did they film that? Once again, you got to hit my memory button. Uh, 77, 78, I think yeah. is when the movie came out. Yeah. Uh, and actually, our our dorm uh, in Wright Claude, Nichols' house, had a really good bicycle team and, uh, you know, did a great job in the uh, – in the little 500, I, can't, I think they finished in the top 10, which is pretty good. And the popularity of the race back then, because I haven't been in such a long time, was like huge because uh, they filled the old 10th Street Stadium. And then, you know, they filmed Breaking Away. And to go watch that movie and to have been in the stands and be part of, uh, of the little 500, and that type of thing, that movie hits so home. And to this day, if it pops up on a channel, I'll try to watch at least a little bit of it. Was it an accurate representation of the life you remember at IU? Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a renegade team like the Cutters, uh, which I think later came into vogue. Uh, But at the same time, it was just... It was like there were there were underdog teams there. You know, our team was an underdog because the fraternities always had the best bike teams. And it was always a uphill battle for dorm teams. There was another dorm team in Right Quad, Dodd's house. They had a very good bicycle team as well. So aside from, you know, it's like how accurate was Hoosiers? Well, Hoosiers was you know, fairly accurate and and caught all the meaningful points. Same thing with Breaking Away. It's like any movie that tries to copy reality. There's going to be some things that are missing. And there's going to be some things that you go, okay, they took cinema liberty. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because anybody who's ever been to the World 500 or went to IU and is part of it, it's basically... There's, there's parts of it that you go, yeah, I, re- I remember something like that. I remember this. I remember that. So I would give it probably a B plus on the uh, accuracy scale. Did you did you decide to go to IU partly based on what on what Bill had to say? Like, this a beautiful campus. You can have so much fun. And No. Or was it something you just kind of decided on your own based on what you wanted to do for a living? Journalism. Um and while I was there, I worked at the Daily Student, and, and you know I covered football with Lee Corso. I covered uh, Indiana soccer with uh, Jerry Yagley, uh, swimming and diving with Doc Councilman and Holy Billingsley, uh, men's gymnastics, uh, intramural sports. But you know, you look back on things in your life and you realize that you know I got. I got to be around Doc Councilman and Jerry Yeagley and Hobie Billingsley. I mean, they're all legends in their respective sports. And now you look at Lee Corso, who was some of a showman. And now today he's like the ultimate showman on ESPN on Saturdays on college football. And so you look back on those relationships and you go, you know, that was, that was a pretty good college gig for me. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm think I'm, I'm trying to picture – or remember a photo did did IU win the national championship in swimming in soccer and in basketball men's basketball all the same year I thought there's a picture with with Yeagley and Councilman and Knight with their trophies Doc didn't win it when I covered them uh Yeagley won his first when I covered the soccer um uh, you know I got to, <laughs> I got to cover uh, the IU soccer team when they played uh, in the national championship game in Philadelphia at Franklin Field of all places in a snow, not a snowstorm, but snowing. Mm-hmm. A fairly open air press box. They tried to keep it closed, but they couldn't keep the cold out. 
So I'm sitting there trying to, you know, monitor the game and write, write about the game. And my fingers were just freezing. And that kind of, that prepared me for later when I covered Notre Dame. <laughs> and, you know, they had the old press box then. And you went up there and if it was a cold day, you, you basically worked with your coat on. Is that a story you retold when, when uh, media members complain about what's going on at the field house? And you say, well, let me tell you one story. It's interesting that you bring that up. Because whenever a media member complains about their seating or almost anything, I have two replies. One, I cover high school basketball for the star for a little bit. I would go and cover the sectional or the city tournament or the county tournament. You know how they have those pull-out portable bleachers? Yes, sir. Well, the students would stomp their feet on the bleachers. And the press table was like in the middle. And you're trying to, and I was, back then, I was very meticulous in keeping track of the game, the type of shot, uh, the time that the shot occurred, these types of stuff. I was trying to do the right thing. And try to do that with those, you know, (laughs) bleachers bouncing underneath you and it was kind of crazy and then I also covered a high school football game at Monrovia and you know I don't know how much time ago I'll try to make this as brief as possible I had to I wrote my story on a little portable typewriter where we had computers and even fax machines I think so I go into and I ended up parking in this field adjacent to the main football field. So I write my story, uh, dictate it back to the office, and I'm going to drive back to the office and then go over the story and resubmit it to the city edition. So I get done writing the story. I go out across the field, get to the gate that I came in. Well, the gate's locked. And I see there's one vehicle in the park, parking area, and it's mine. I'm trying to figure out, how do I do this? So I end up climbing the fence, having my little portable typewriter in a case, tossing it over the fence, breaking it. And I walk in my car, and I start driving back downtown. And all of a sudden, and it was a cold night, and I, I got the heat on, this really god-awful smell starts creeping into the car. And I realized that when... Um, I got back to the office and, you know, looked at my shoes. I had stepped in cow dung. And so those are the two things that I tell media people. I said, you got a gripe? Well, let me tell you a couple of things. <laughs> you know, my other thing I always tell them, I said, you have, you know, you have a really good job, whether you realize it at this point or not. And you should be blessed that you got, like, a seat, and back then the seat was usually pretty good, whether it was basketball or football or whatever, and just be happy to be here, you know? And that's kind of the way I approached most of the events that I ever covered as a, as a sports writer. You mentioned I had this question written down, but I'll ask it now since we mentioned both breaking away and Hoosiers. Do you have a favorite sports movie? Ooh, I would think it would probably be Hoosiers is right up there. Um, he's got game, uh, had Ray Allen in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good sports movie. I think Bull Durham's a good movie. Um, I can't forget what was the one about, uh, with, the, with the, the women's baseball team. A League of Their Own? A League of Their Own. Yeah, those, those were all good, entertaining sports movies. Do you consider Caddyshack a sports movie? No. <laughs> but if it was. <laughs> but it would rank right, it would rank right up there. <laughs> was, when that first came out, I laughed so hard. And that's another one. If it pops up on the channel, I'll, I'll watch it for a little bit because I can play so much. You are actually, if 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 I have my chronology correct, speaking of uh, terrific movies that came out during your time in college, the greatest college movie of all time. Animal House. 
What did you think of that movie? What did your friends think of it? You know, as, oh. as you were had the college experience. We all, we all loved it because we all lived it in some form or another. Um, I, you know, I still get together with my college friends every year for a golf weekend. We've been doing it for like 37 years now, something like that. And, you know, we, we talk about college days and how rambunctious <laughs> of us were. We tell the same lies, but we all refer to the, as they say, keggers that we have. <laughs> so, yeah, there's anybody that watches Animal House that went to college and had some sort of college life, they can all relate at some point in that movie. You get to work with and I'm assuming you've known him for a long time to remain in your college years. And we're talking to David Benner, who's director of media relations for the Indiana Pacers. Uh, you must swap stories from time to time with Mr. Quinn Buckner, captain of the 76 IU undefeated national championship team, who frequently does uh, color commentary on Pacers games. I we don't talk about that much. I do. I do relate the story when I got to go to the Purdue IU game up at Purdue, and I think that is that the game that Scott May broke his arm. Was the year before That's they, in seven. Yeah, in seventy five. Mm-hmm. The year before they won a championship, and then we're on their way to an undefeated season, and possibly a national championship. Um, so I tell him, I said, I, every once in a while, I'll mention to him. I said, you realize, Glenn, I said, I almost got mugged because of you because I'm in Mackey Arena and I'm an IU fan and he made a he made like a, a, a basket of some sort and I stood up and you know put both my arms in the air and shouted out out of the way Quinn <laughs> and the next thing I know you know I have these people around me telling me that I should sit down and shut up and I'm not a fighter so I decided I would sit down and shut up. <laughs> you just let the scoreboard do the talking for you? The scoreboard do the talking. On the list of, you know, when you talk about this particularly Coach Knight's accomplishments, and I may ask a question of, about uh, him, and the same question I asked Robin Miller when he was on okay. along with your brother. Maybe get the same answer, maybe not. Uh, on the list of Knight's accomplishments, I, I think the most underrated accomplishment uh, one that does not get enough credit is the fact that he went 36 and 0. He and his team did in the Big Ten. They went 18 and 0, and then 18 and 0 consecutive years. That's unfathomable to do. I mean, one year is okay. That's an, a remarkable achievement. It hasn't happened since. But to do it two years in a row, what do you think of of Coach Knight and his his legacy? Uh, there's probably two answers to that. Answer number one is what he accomplished, uh, how he accomplished it during his heyday years, is a testament to not only him, but the players that he had. And that was back in the day when recruiting was not as cutthroat as it has been in recent years in this day. And he could basically go out and get guys because of who he was and the record that they had. He didn't have one and dones back then. He just had a lot of, I want to say, freedom to pick and choose your players. Mm-hmm. A, it's a competition uh, rather than a freedom. So having said that, yeah, what he accomplished, and under any era, what he did accomplish was remarkable. As you know, I got on in later life and different stories, uh, including uh, my last year at the Star before I went to the Pacers. I covered Notre Dame football in the fall and Indiana basketball in the winter. So I dealt with Lou Holtz, uh, who was like one of the most accessible guys you ever wanted to come across, and a great coach. And then I covered Bob Knight. And that year that I covered him was, was Damon Bailey's senior year. And they had a very good team. That was the last Sweet 16. That's right. 
Yeah. They beat Kentucky that year too at the dome. <laughs> well, that's a good story. Um, so, and they they had a chance to maybe win another championship, but Sharon Wilkerson broke his arm, uh, and I think it was one of the regional games. And I always, and that was the same year that Knight kicked his son in the Notre Dame game. Had betted Sharon Wilkerson at the uh, Michigan State game. They got beat by 50 at Minnesota. Mm-hmm. It was just a very crazy year. And I, I tell people this day, every time I got in the car to go to Bloomington or to go to the airport, all I could think of is, what's it going to be now? What's going to be the next thing to hit? And he didn't talk to the media until February. At all? He talked to them after they beat Kentucky. But he didn't talk to the media until February. And you said you, you had a story about that game, the IU Kentucky game? Uh, well, just the fact that he, well, it, it's part of a list, real quickly. Uh, in four weeks in su- succession, I covered the so called game of the century, Notre Dame and Florida State. Florida State was number one. Notre Dame beat them at, at the time, Notre Dame. Then the next week, Boston College came in to play Notre Dame. Ugh. Ugh. Got beat on a last second field goal, in which that last drive, a Notre Dame linebacker who shall remain nameless, uh, had an interception in his gut and dropped it. Coach, I won't say his name either. <laughs> the, why I can remember that, I don't know. But the third week was the IU Kentucky game at the Dome. And obviously, in Kentucky, here's the thing Florida State was number one. Then Notre Dame became number one. Boston College beat them. Indiana played Kentucky. Kentucky, I believe, was number one. I think that's right. Indiana beat them. So the fourth week of that, Indiana comes to Butler. Butler, And Butler upsets Indiana. I I don't know what Indiana was ranked, but it doesn't matter. But to see four games like that in succession was just like, you know, the sports writer's dream. And am I correct in remembering that the team that beat IU in the first game of the regionals after the Sweet 16, wasn't that, didn't they lose to Boston College in that tournament? Uh, Bill Curley was the center. Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, Lou Holtz and Knight and Gene Cady, of course, who's been a guest on the podcast. He was a terrific guest after I shook his hand at the Cityway YMCA and asked him to come on the program. And I said, may I shake your hand, sir, even though – I'm still mad at you for beating IU. And he cursed at me and said, I'm still mad at you for beating us. <laughs> I didn't do anything, but what a night, what an incredible man. But you know, had the, you, you covered sports and we'll get to, we'll get back to how kind of how your career started, but staying on this uh, messaging arc, you covered sports where there was Larry Brown, where there were some real dinosaurs. And I say that as a compliment, uh, those old time coaches who grew up and came to maturity in the fifties and sixties and seventies, how were they kind of as a collective group, easy to deal with, hard to deal with, short tempered. Uh, Lou was great to deal with. He would come in on Tuesdays and Notre Dame would bring in a player and he got to interview the player. And then Lou would get up on the podium and basically answer questions for 45 minutes every Tuesday. And he was entertaining. Uh, matter of fact, uh, then you go to night, and like I said, access was very, very difficult. You know, I kept crying for Greg Elkin. You know, we got the, is there any chance I can sit down and talk to Coach Knight? And I talked to Coach Knight. And he eventually gave way you know, in February, um, Larry Brown, <laughs> Larry Brown was great. I mean, to this day, I love that guy. He, uh, he, he was, he was different and he was, he was the guy. And let me tell you something, all three are great coaches. And, uh, but Larry would, you know, if a player had a good game, Larry fell in love with him. Player had a bad game. Larry wanted to trade him the next day. And, you know, Donnie Walsh tells the story all the time about how Larry would come in every day in the office. You got to trade this guy. You got to trade this guy. 
And Larry and Donnie would say, okay, Larry, I'll see what I can do. And then once Larry left, Donnie just brushed it off and he'd forget about it because Larry would move on to the next guy the next day. <laughs> bad practice. Larry wanted to trade him. Um, so a, a couple things along those lines. Night, I, you know, I got to watch a practice once and I got to watch the Volks practice. The amazing thing about those two guys is something would happen and they would stop play and they would go back to like three possessions later and recall where every guy was and what who made mistakes. They're, the fact that they could like zone in on that, on what was happening in the moment, and then 10 minutes had passed, they would go back and recite everything that would happen, just blew you away. Um, moving on to Larry, my favorite Larry's, well, I got two favorite Larry stories. Uh, we played the Clippers out in L.A. We won the game. And back then, Larry wanted to talk to the team before we'd take guys out for post-game interviews. So I'm standing by the outside the locker room, and this guy comes up, and he's got a baseball cap on, and he walks right past the security people and starts going to the locker room. I said, hey, uh, excuse me for a minute. You can't go in yet. Larry's still talking to the team. And you were working for the Pacers at the time. The Pacers at the time. And – he said, well, I'm a good friend of Larry's. And I go, and you are? And he goes, Billy Crystal. I went, oh, hang on a minute, Mr. Crystal. <laughs> Who's a huge Knicks fan, as I recall, is he, is he not? Huge Clippers fan. Billy Crystal's a huge Clippers fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isn't he New York born and bred? Like, like He is, but he's a, he, you know, he, he's out in L.A. making movies and stuff. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, the guy's really short. I didn't know who he was. I've seen his movies, and he's got a ball cap on. How do I know? So he's trying to be inconspicuous, but he expects you to recognize him. He's trying to be in, Yeah, I'm, I'm sure out there everybody knows who he is, but I'm just some rude from Indiana who watches his movies, and he looks bigger on screen than he does in person. So it's an easy mistake to make. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, my, my second Larry story was his last year with the team, he is, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that he's done. He's not going to coach anymore, blah, blah, blah. So he calls me up on Saturday before our last game on a Sunday afternoon. He says, hey, you know, I'm going to hang it up tomorrow. You might want to get a press release together. I said, okay. I said, have you discussed this with Donnie? He goes, I haven't talked to Donnie about this. And I went, what? He goes, I will, I will. I said, okay. So I prepare a press release. Donnie's out in Arizona covering the pre-draft camp back then. I go to the airport to meet Donnie when he gets off the plane. I've got the press release in his hand. I said, hey, just so you're aware, Larry's going to resign tomorrow. Here's the press release. And Donnie goes, oh, God. You know, Donnie, typical Donnie. Oh, yeah, well, that's Larry. Donnie says to me, he'll change his mind by tomorrow. I go, well, I just want to let you know we're going to be prepared, blah, blah, blah. So we get to the press conference, post-game press conference. And of course, the first question says, Larry, you know, there's a lot of speculation that you're going to, you know, resign. Uh, what can you comment on that? And Larry goes, I don't know where that came from. I've only discussed it with three people, Donnie Walsh, my wife, and David Benner. And I'm, I'm like going, don't throw me under the bus. Well, because they always assume the PR person is the leaker and we're never the leaker. Yeah. And I, and I was like, going, and by the way, he had told two writers, one of them, my brother, uh, <laughs> the writer that he was going to resign. So I'm sitting there going, well, it, it isn't just Donnie and your wife and me. It's been others. And God knows who else he told. But that was Larry. And, and he did not resign that day. He waited a couple of days before he did. So, You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, 
and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is David Benner, former Indianapolis star journalist and has been for the past 25 years, director of media relations for the Indiana Pacers. David, is there a particular Hoosier leader or legend you admire most? That's a good question. Probably, well, I mean, Don Walsh would rank right up there. Larry Bird would rank right up there. Um, and I'd say because I spent so many years around Don and he was instrumental in my hiring, um, so I'd say he's probably number one. Larry, Larry's right up there. Um, yeah, th- those two I'd say stand out because they were, they're both very unique individuals and, you know, yeah, I'll leave it with that. They're both very unique individuals who did a great job when they were in the positions they were in when I was around. Through, through the intercession of his wonderful, wonderful daughter, Shannon, Donnie Walsh came on the podcast. He was such a terrific guest. It was such an honor to talk to him. Very engaging. Still very New York, though. You know, my family, part of my family is from New Jersey. So you kind of recognize it uh, when you when you hear it. But he was very forthcoming. Is that kind of how he was as a boss? Very engaging, easy to work with in a pretty high pressure environment. Yeah. And I still tease him to this day that the only time he ever lied was around draft time. Because he never wanted to tip his hand about which direction he's going, which is why he got Chuck Person, which is why he got Reggie Miller. Um, and he's he's as, he's as good a man as you'll ever want to encounter. I mean, he's just a great person um, and did a lot for this community that people don't know. Um, and look at the Pacers' track record when Donnie was in charge. He took a team that was going nowhere. And ended up, you know, I wish I had the sheet in front of me, but, you know, we've made the playoffs like 20 out of 25 years or something like that. And he was there for it. He, you know, he was the guy that got us to the NBA finals and then then reconstructed the team to be really, really good in uh, the mid-2000 season or 2000 era. Uh to where we go to the conference finals. We had a team capable of winning a championship on many occasions. So, and then you go off the, off the court with dying, and you could just you could talk to him about anything. Um, and he, when I was a writer, I once uh, wrote something that he didn't agree with, and he sends me a letter. And then, and then the letter, all of this is your world, exclamation point, with a button of outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie Walsh. <laughs> let's let's talk. We kind of uh, pushed forward a little bit on various topics and kind of went to IU because I know how important that school is to you and 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 your brother, obviously, and and. Jane Jankowski, obviously, uh, so many people in in Indiana just are love Bloomington, love IU. But you very quickly started working, if that's the right term, I think it is, because you worked hard, probably didn't get paid or get paid very much at the Indianapolis Star. You know, was that your? Go ahead. Did it for love. Did it for love. <laughs> you and Jeff Smolian and uh, another podcast guest, by the way, and Bill Benner. Um, was that your goal? You wanted to write for the star? Yeah. Yes. Because, um, you know, I started there as a copy boy when I was 17. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. Well, I still haven't grown up, but I sat around and dabbled at writing. I took two years of typing in high school. Little at the time did I realize how much that would influence my life because all of a sudden I found a, a quick way to write and do things like that. So um, while working at the Star as a copy boy before I 
could save money and, and go to school. You know, I'd sit around, I'd write goofy little, you know, satires, national lampoon type things about people I knew in the sports department. And I also started on Friday nights covering high school football and basketball for the then uh, Daily Journal. Now it's the Johnson County Daily Journal. And so that's how I kind of got a feel for it. And a couple people encouraged me and said, hey, you know, you've got a knack for this. You ought, to, you ought to look at it and pursue it. And so that led to me going to IU because the journalism school, and, you know, the Daily Student was a very highly regarded college newspaper. So it made it kind of a natural transition. And while there, you know, I build up, I wouldn't say a resume, but I build up a clip file of covering all the different sports that I cover. And, you know, the star, thankfully, you know, John Batch, God bless him, uh, hired me. And I was a desk person. And they would throw me an occasional bone, you know, go cover a high school game, go do this, go do that. Uh, and it was, it became in my blood. And the thing I liked about it was it was different every day. Whether you were on the desk in the office working with Bill or Robin or whoever, or going out to cover something, it was different every day. And then, you know, I tell people, I've said this many times, I haven't, except in high school when I bailed hay and laid sod, I've never had a real job. <laughs> you, you came to the star in 78. And uh, one of the big events, huge event, probably second, I would say, obviously, the Indianapolis 500 was the biggest event. And that was wrapped up by Robin Miller, whose passing uh, is very recent. I want to get your thoughts on him in a few minutes. But in 1978, the single class basketball tournament was such a gigantic happening, let alone an event. I know Mr. Bill Benner's thoughts on multi-class basketball. Would you like to weigh in on, on the difference between now and then? Yeah, I understand Bill's passion. And the 72, 73, or no, 71, 72 center girl team, I was the student manager because I basically sucked as a basketball. I sucked as an athlete. <laughs> Those who can't do right. Let's just don't, let's just don't you know, isolate it on one sport. I was bad at them all. But uh, our team went to the final eight in the state. And we upset Richmond, that was ranked, I think, number five in the state at the time, on our last second shot in Eagle Field House. We were the smallest school left in the Sweet 16. So I catch the dynamic of the single class basketball that Bill is so passionate about. But I also think, had we had class basketball back then, we might have been a state champion. I mean, our team is that good. So I see both sides. I also see, you know, somebody, not my brother, strengthening out. Somebody said, well, I'll just give him partic participation ribbons and stuff like that. Well, a really small school in the state that makes it to the Class A state finals or, you know, the center state or whatever, that, what that does for the community, I think, is often overlooked. And I think it's very important because I was part of the small school experience of having success in the state tournament. And it was, like, amazing. It was great. It was, you know... To come, come back from losing to Connersville, which went on to win the state that year, to come back to the gym and see the gym packed with all those fans, you, you don't, a lot of schools and a lot of young athletes don't get to experience that. So I, I get it. Um, you know, Center Grove now is a football power. They have a really good uh, boys and girls golf team that has a great softball program. And but they're in the they're in the upper class now. They're in the the big school class. Why well, would we want to see Center Grove 
football play a small school in football under this dynamic. Uh, basketball, it's, you know, I don't know if it's the same way or not, but because you're only dealing with five five players, um, 12 man roster, and you can have one guy that can carry it. But at the same time, I, I, I see both sides of the argument, and I think it's a, uh, it's always going to be an interesting debate. Bills are never going to be happy, but in the meantime, you got to think. You got to think of the small schools. You got to think of the communities and what it does for them. It's interesting. Here we are in 2021, uh, listening to you to refer to how small Center Grove was, and the last time I drove past it, it looks like a junior college. I mean, it's massive you know, to their credit. Do you remember? Do you have a single high school athlete you covered? who was just so good, He's the memory has stuck with you all these years? Scott Skiles. Plymouth? Plymouth. I mean, I covered the Fort Wayne Center State that he was in and watched him. Well, actually, there's two, George McGinnis. Huh. I loved watching George McGinnis. But, you know, I was a kid then. Right. And when I was a teenager, almost a teenager, yeah, around teenage years, but... Watching, and I only saw George play on TV. But Scott Skiles, you know, for a 6 1 guard, single handedly, you know, got them to the state championship. Uh, and he was just, it was amazing how he could take over a game for a 6 1 guard. And he, like I said, he kind of won the center state on his own. Then he won the first game. Uh, in the finals, kind of on his own. I mean, they had a good team. They had good complementary pieces. And in the state championship, I can't remember the young man's name, kind of, you know, supplemented Scott. But he was he was so entertaining as a high school player. That it was, but I would put Scott Skiles live in person, uh, George and Dennis on television, because George was talk about a league of their own. George is in a league of his own. And we're trying to get uh, Mr. McGinnis on the podcast and to talk to him a little bit, do something about a little bit of a, of a slick Leonard retrospective and talk about the ABA days. We'd love to talk to him because he gets mentioned frequently as, as like, you don't understand how much bigger and stronger and better George McGinnis was than everybody else on the court until he got to the NBA. But before then. Yeah, it, it, it's funny you mention that because Somebody asked me who I thought was the best high school player ever in the state of Indiana. And you, you think of Oscar. I mean, there's been so many of them. But I've never seen anybody like George. Just for his size and his mobility and his the way he dominated the game, I... I vote George, I vote Oscar, I vote George 1, I vote Oscar 1A. And all I've seen of Oscar, again, this is who you see, uh, all I've seen of Oscar is like old film clips. Sure. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, you went to the Star, 1978. It was a few years after that, that the Hoosier Dome was built. And the Pacer, excuse me, the Colts moved here from Baltimore. Talk to us a little bit on the Leaders and Legends podcast, your reaction to that news. Not necessarily the dome being built. That's obviously a, a cool subject. But you as a sports writer at the biggest paper in the state, and now you have an NFL franchise right down the street from Star Headquarters. Um, my reaction is... That opened the door for me to cover the Pacers. Because Dave Overbeck was covering the Pacers, and they moved him and John Banch, you know, over to cover the Colts, along with, uh, you know, the columnists at the time, whether it be Bill or Robin or whoever. So my reaction, you know, the one thing is you, you grow up there and you hear all the remarks about Indian no place. And it hits you hard. And, you know, the Colts coming opened up a, a variety of doors for a lot of things that happened. You know, the NCAA coming, 
opened up a lot of doors for a lot of things to happen. And, you know, downtown became a vibrant place. Downtown on Sundays, which was like, what was going on on Sundays before the Colts came? Nothing. Nothing. Restaurants weren't open. So it helped solidify us as a big league city. And I always take offense for a quick opinion there. I take offense to those who refer to this as a football town. No, it's not a football town. It's a sports town. Just look at the different events that are hosted between NCAA swimming and diving championships, you know, the Pan Am games, you know, the Pacers, the Colts. I mean, the different, I mean, even now with all the, you go downtown on the weekends, there's a major volleyball tournament here, or there's a major basketball tournament here. Uh, the proliferation of what's going on at uh, Grand Park out in uh, Westfield. It's a sports day now, everybody. Um, it's, you know, you could always say it was a, we've been a basketball state. Yeah, I think you can make that argument fairly easily. But we since have evolved in this particular area or a sports town. It's not a football town. It's not a basketball town. It's a sports town, which I think is great. 25 years ago, or let's say, let's say even before then, if I had said in 2012, Indianapolis would not only host a Super Bowl, but completely redefine for the F- NFL what it meant to host a Super Bowl, you would have said, if I just happened to make that statement in 1984. It'll never happen. I, I mean, you face the reality of it, the, you know, when we, worked at the, when we worked at the Star and we would go to lunch at 7.30, 8 o'clock after we took the first edition away, there, were, there was the St. Fritz uh, restaurant downtown. There was... Uh, there just wasn't much for you to go do. And, you know, you look, at, you look back at 1984 or whatever and you say, oh, you're going to host a Super Bowl. You're not going to host a Super Bowl. Super Bowl's in January or February. They ain't going to want to come here and freeze the nuts off. <laughs> you know, and, hey, we had the All-Star game here and we had freaking Blizzard. You know, the NBA All-Star game. We had that and we had a Blizzard. Um so you just you look at the logistics and about how everybody wants to go to a warm weather city in February, and it, yeah, yeah, no way. Let me append to that before we move on. If let's say twenty years ago, twenty five years ago, I would have said there is a a national health crisis worldwide, but a national health crisis so terrible and ubiquitous that the city of Indianapolis is going to host the entire NCAA tournament. You would have said. You know, and again, that's, you look at that and I've been to other cities, I've been to a lot of other cities that have hosted major sporting events and things like that. Who does it better? Who could pull that off? But again, back then, you're going pandemic. They're going to host the NCAA tournament? No way. <laughs> but guess what? They found a way. And they always do. You know, oh, you got a Super Bowl. You got a men's final four. You got a women's final four. Um, yeah. We got swimming championships. We got, we got Olympic trials. Yeah. We can do it. If there was a sporting event, any sporting event in history you wish you could have covered or whether it's a, a team or in a particular game, which would you choose? Um, two parts to that. I would have liked to have gone to an Olympics. I'm jealous of Bill for that. And I will say the best thing that I ever covered was the Olympic swimming trials. That were here? Yeah. Where they built a swimming pool in the field house? Uh, that was for that was like for United. That was like for a U.S. event. I think that was the U.S. Open 
So this would be at the natatorium? This would be at the natatorium. And to see, and it, ha it happens in track and field, I'm sure it happens in other sports, but to see dreams crushed or fulfilled by one one thousandth of a second made it so unique. You know, these young athletes compete and train for four years with the ultimate goal. Your ultimate exposure is the Olympics for a sport like that. And to see, like I said, to see hopes dashed or fulfilled it's just like an amazing, amazing thing, you know, to see them, you know, touch the wall. And you see it in the Olympics, they touch the wall and they turn and immediately look to see where they ended up finishing. And it's either splashes of joy or tears, you know. And it, that, covering that, like, hit me better, hit me more than anything I've ever covered. If you could interview any sports finger figure in history interview any sports figure in history whom would you choose Muhammad Ali. did you ever meet him yes he was at uh he was at one of our games uh and came to the locker room afterwards and met everybody but that was when i played what parkinson's disease what he had mm -hmm. it, it had taken hold so he was but he was still very engaging. But in his prime, I would have loved to have been in the home that way. <laughs> that would because he was so he was so outspoken, so brash, and he, you know, he talked the talk, but he backed it up. He walked the walk. You know, he was he was brazen. He was outspoken, and he was he was a damn good fighter. So yeah, Muhammad Ali would be number one. Kind of hard to, for folks coming of age, you know, now or in maybe the past 10, 15 years to realize how gigantic boxing was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's just, I couldn't name any champion now, but back in 1970s, early 80s, middleweight, welterweight, you kind of knew them all, whether it's because of wild world, wide world of sports or, or just the fact that they, the sport itself was so popular. Uh, one question I wanted to make sure that I asked you, because uh, he's my dream. He is probably my dream Leaders and Legends uh, podcast guest, and that's Mr. Larry Bird. Uh, <laughs> what I, I'm holding out hope, uh, very, very faint. But, you know, obviously it would be beyond a dream to be able to have a conversation uh, with someone who's so remarkable at his craft. But, but what was it like to work with him and for him? Uh, it was a joy. And you know the one the thing about Larry is there's no black and white. And there's no I'm gonna say that there is black and white. There's no gray with him. He um uh, to engage with him on a daily basis for three years, you know, three you know, fairly successful years. It was fun then to deal with him later as a you know, front office person making the decisions. It was it was the same thing. And you know, I got when I was a writer, I got to know him a little bit because every time we go to Boston, I'd have to do the obligatory Larry Bird story for the star. And so that's kind of how he, you know, I, I got to know him a little bit. But he one of my favorite Larry stories was when he first got hired as a uh, coach, an AP writer from New York calls me and says, hey, he says, can you ask Larry, I've got one simple question. Does he think Michael Jordan is the best player ever? I said, well, I don't know if they'll answer, but I'll go ask him. So I go to see Larry and I go, Larry, explain to him what the thing is. Michael Jordan the best player ever? Larry's reply, he's in the top two. <laughs> He didn't identify the other one? Uh, he didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly who he meant, too. But he, you know, I talked about Knight and Holtz earlier. Larry, Larry had the same, same makeup of 
to go in his office, you know, before a game to talk to him about something or rather. And he would, uh, he'd have an old Celtics game on. And sit there and he goes, now watch this. He says, there, this happens, this happens. Now four plays down, four plays down the road here. This will happen, this will happen. This. He has an amazing recollection for things that transpired in games that he played in. Um, and he was, and I'll tell you what, they gave a lot of credit to Dick Carter and Rick Carlisle, Dick being a defensive guy and Rick being the offensive guy, which was justified. But Larry was a hell of a coach. Uh, and they, they go, well, he inherited a really talented team. Yeah, he inherited a really talented team that had egos and wanted playing time and all this other stuff. You know, and Jalen Rose, who was like one of the problem children when he got there, Jalen to this day, you know, idolizes Larry for what he did for Jalen uh, as a player. And, you know, and like I said, Larry, you know, Larry had a simple thing. He said, hey, we're going to practice for an hour and 15 minutes. You guys want to go longer? Then don't practice hard. You want to keep it an hour and 15 minutes? Then practice hard. Very simple. I mean, I mean he... Yeah. Was he intimidating? Was he an intimidating figure? I mean, he's obviously very big. He's like six nine, six six ten. Had this amazing career. He's on everyone's. He's in everybody's top ten list. Uh, greatest NBA players of all time. Spectacular high school and college career. I mean, how do you? That's a lot to deal with. I guess is what I'm trying to say, and or maybe I'm wrong. And how did you deal with it? Because he, I mean, he is Larry Legend. He's yeah. Bottom line is he's Larry Bird, uh, and. Right, one of the all-time greats to ever play the game. So he can be intent. He's intimidating. He's intimidating to the players that played for him until they got to know him. And it's the Larry is one of your more basic, uh, true to the. True to the earth is the right explanation. Human beings will ever want to encounter. He's funny. He's witty. He's smart. He's intelligent. Um, he's just he's got the whole he's got the whole package. And I don't think that what because I've been around him so long and been around him enough both for this when he was a coach and he was a front office guy. Um, there's also a humbleness to him. You know, there's a humbleness and there's a competitive spirit to him. It's, you, you don't ever, you, you don't lose to him in anything. Cornhole, you know, two throws, whatever. But at the same time, we go, when he was in the front office, we go to play Boston in the playoffs. And I do a travel list, and on the travel list is everybody that travels. So they give me credentials for everybody. So I go to Larry. And I go, hey, you don't need this around here, but here's your credential. And he goes, and he proceeds to take the credential and put it on. I go, Larry, you, I just gave it to you just for the hell of it. You're Larry freaking bird in Boston Garden. I don't <laughs> think you need a credential. He said, well, you gave it to me, so I should wear it. So, you know, there's there's that part of it, too. Um, but I... I, I still laugh at that, but, you know, you walk through Boston Garden on one of his, his numbers in the wrappers, his pictures on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing his credentials. Could you name, let me ask it a different way, as within a few minutes we have left, will you name your Pacers starting five since you've been there? Ooh. Wow, I have people asking my favorite player and things like that. Well, Reggie Miller, uh, Jermaine O'Neal, Dale. And I see, sometimes my personal interactions enter into this. Um, Jermaine, Dale Davis is a power forward. Uh, so that's what three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a 
Point guard on the other. I mean, sorry. Those really good teams. Probably, I'm trying to go with Mark Jackson as the point guard. If I'm going by position, in the small forward, I'd probably have to go with Paul George. I'm sure I'll leave somebody out and I'll go back. I'll go back two hours from now and go, oh, crap. <laughs> we've, we've talked a little bit. We've mentioned uh, someone I think it's fair to say we both love, and that's Bill Benner. Yeah former columnist and uh, journalist, then the Indianapolis star uh, who retires and keeps working. It's one of the things we love about him. Uh, what was it like when you went over to the Pacers and he's still at the star? Now go ask him that question. I wouldn't tell him anything. <laughs> Zero. And you go, Oh, come on, I'm your brother. And I go, yeah, but are you going to pay me when I get fired? <laughs> I don't think so. And by the way, Speaking of Bill Benner and, you know, throwing Bob Knight back into this, Bill taught me how to water ski. That was like playing under Bob Knight. There were a lot of bad words uttered in my direction because I did not pick up water skiing quite as quickly as Bill thought I should. What about skiing? Uh, no. he took Actually, he took me one time down to, uh, oh, back then it was Nashville Alps. Right, that's right. Back in the day, my sister worked there. Oh, I tell you what, I tried. I tried to ski, and then, I, you know, I struggled with it. And I woke up the next day, and I was sore as hell. And I told Bill, "I am done. I'm not doing this ever again." <laughs> now he's doing it at age, you know, eighty nine or however old he is, and uh, and he's going to like the Blue Diamond Hill or a slope, or <laughs> twenty miles an hour. And he wonders why his back hurts. Yeah, I have no idea, Bill. Another name we mentioned a, a few minutes ago when we were talking about uh, public relations and media is is your wife, Jane Jankowski, who used to work for Indiana University, as I recall, but spent eight years, I think the entire eight years, as Governor Mitch Daniels' communications person, press secretary, and she currently works for uh, Governor Eric Holcomb. Uh, was it... She's incredibly well respected. Does an amazing job. You know, everybody knows her, has a high opinion of her. Was it helpful to have her as someone to like bounce ideas off of, or was it something you guys just really did? We don't discuss work at home. No, no. It, it's it's good to be able to talk to someone who kind of understands what you go through and. I'll tell you why. I've my position is far easier than you know when she was with Mitch. And now she's like deputy chief of staff for Eric. And you know the her stuff is like real life. You know it's it's, it's the pandemic. It's uh, you know opening the the automobile facility near Greensburg. You know, it's it's things that affect people on a daily basis. Mine is a little bit different, but yeah, it, we we just you know, we discuss things probably more often than people would realize. And, and trust me, she offers her opinion. I don't always agree with it, but she offers her opinion. <laughs> her stuff, you know, like I said, I try to stay out of it because that's way over my head. You know, the legislature is discussing the budget. I can barely figure out my own budget within the Pacers. So, um, but no, she's been a, a wonderful sounding board and, and put up with a lot of stuff over the years, you know, with all with the travel that this job entails and, and uh, you know, my recent health issues. How long have you been married? Me, in, in 20 years. 20 years. Uh last question I want to ask you about the Pacers. And then I do want to ask one question about your health. And then we will get to the five questions with which we end all podcasts. Oh boy. Worst night in your career. The oh, brawl. Yeah. No question. I, I Netflix, was, Netflix recently, I think it's Netflix released this documentary about it. Did you watch it? Did you need to? And, uh, and without, you know, I don't want to keep bringing up a bad subject per se, but 
did you just walk off the court like I can't believe what my next week of my life is going to be like? I yeah, I watched the documentary. I thought it was fair. I thought it be a better version of our side of the story. Um, I was not at the game. I, did, I skipped that trip. But when oh, when the, when all hell broke loose, I immediately you know. I was in communication with uh, Jeff McCoy, who's my assistant, who's at the game, and said, whatever you do, don't let anybody in that locker room talk. You know, we, we can't do that. And then I went to the airport uh, and met the team and basically told them, I said, when you exit, don't run over anybody. Don't roll down your window. Don't talk to anybody. Uh, because this you know, it was evident by what happened, it was going to become a legal matter. Mm-hmm. And you didn't need to have yourself quoted on television and you know, sent worldwide some ridiculous statement that you would utter. So just keep your mouth shut, keep your windows rolled up and go home. Were you watching the game on television? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know the the funny thing was we we went out to dinner with uh, another couple, and I kept you know I kept going to the TV to see how the game was going at halftime because he had a good first half. The halftime interview on ESPN was on our chest, so I was thinking, well, good, you know, this is good. We're going to be nine and two and be our arch rival in the East. And then I get home, sitting there watching the watching the game, thinking, well, oh, this is even better. We're beating the crap out of them. And then all hell broke loose, and I yelled at Jane. I said, oh, bleep. And she goes, oh, bleep, you're right. And so, yeah, it was a very, very interesting week from that standpoint. Because, you know, the media showed up at every practice and you know, basically said, nobody's going to talk about it. Yeah. It was neat. We really cannot talk about it. Now, that was the best or worst, worst night, and real quickly, the best, best night as far as chaos was the Michael Jordan return game, my first year there. So, you know, we had 24 hours notice to prepare for an NBA Finals game, basically. So you knew, actually, I have that question written down because I wanted to ask you about Reggie hitting the shot, um, the deep three in the playoffs against the bulls where everyone goes crazy and, and bird acts like he's in a coma, which is yeah. that video is so fun to watch because just the, just the reaction, the reaction to birds, non-reaction when Miller hits that deep three, but I watched the, the Jordan return game. So you got 24 hours notice and you have to keep it quiet or does everybody know? No, we had 24 hours notice. Um, like we were practicing a part two because there was a hockey game in uh, Market Square Arena that night. And the game the next day was like at 12 noon. So the turnaround, like I said, the turnaround from you know hockey on Saturday night to a nationally televised game that suddenly became provincial-wise an NBA Finals game. And, you know, about 14 hours left, you know, getting the building ready was, uh, you know, they had like 13 hours to do that. And I just remember telling guys that requested credentials. I said, I'll get you a credential. I can't guarantee you a seat. And, you know, the building crew did a, I mean, amazing job. And, you know, I got, came home, slept two hours, and went back to the arena. And I left at, like, 2 and got up at 4 and was down to the arena by 5. But it was great because we won the game. I was just going to say, we won the game. Uh, last question I want to ask you, and you alluded to it just a few minutes ago. You have been fighting uh, ferociously and courageously, um, a significant health, health issue for a few years now. Uh, please, tell, there's a, please tell the Leaders and Legends podcast audience uh, how you're feeling, how you're doing. Uh, right now, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Um, I got colon cancer in 2010. Removed part of my colon, uh, went pretty cancer free for what, seven years, seven, eight years, and then I think it was 18. I got sick again, it had 
can't remember what the word is. Meticulated? Metastasized? Yeah, there you go. I've been wondering what that damn word is. <laughs> uh, Benefit of an IPS education. Well, okay. So anyway, I uh, uh, it did that to the fatty tissue of my stomach. So I've been off and on chemo for you know three years now. Uh, but you know, it just it crops up at different times, and the oncologist says you know it's kind of be in your blood. It's going to be something you're going to have to face, and so. I face it and I deal with it and I'm doing taking chemo pills now. But, you know, the other thing is, um, not, I don't want to sound too melodramatic, but, you know, we, our players on occasion, you know, pre pandemic, and I'm sure they'll resume once we get past that, but we go and visit Riley Children's Hospital and you, mm. you see those kids there. And, you know, you think to yourself, well, I've had a life, you know, and I've, had a, I've had a good life. And then you take it, you know, to when you go and you get infusions or you go to the cancer center or whatever you have to go, and you see other people there that you just know that they're worse off than you. And you go, yeah, I, I can't complain. I won't. It's some. It's a card I've been dealt. You deal with it, and you trust your doctors, and you thank every day for these wonderful people that work in these cancer centers and all the stuff and all the stuff they do. You recently, uh, Indianapolis and the motorsports world, and and your brother. I know they were very close. You lost your friend Robin Miller. Uh, give us just five to ten words. Describing Robin Miller. Grass, profane, the heart of gold. Um, and a hell of a writer. We've reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast where we ask all of our guests the same question. Are you ready? Oh, boy. Okay. What was your first job? Ooh, laying sod. <laughs> That's a first. Hey, I, I laid sod and I bailed hay. Neither one of them was fun. And I decided back then, this is in high school, decided back then, I got to find something a little bit easier. What was your first concert? <laughs> uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Not bad at all. If you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Ooh. Oh, wow. Well, I like humor. Uh, so, semi tough, Dan Jenkins. But book's better than the movie, I'm guessing. Oh, much better. I remember Bob Kravitz and I were hu are huge. I haven't talked to him in a while, but are huge um, North Dallas 40 fans, that movie. Uh, yeah. And Slapshot, I guess I should say. Uh, <laughs> number four, if you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? See, that, that becomes an easy one. Olympics. Do you have a particular Olympic? No. Any, any Olympics, I think, would be great to witness. Just because you get to see somebody, see, you single out one thing, that makes it hard. But when you say the Olympics, that means, oh, I get to go see all these things. <laughs> the last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, living today, two hours off the record, whom would you choose? Oh. <laughs> wow. Probably Barack Obama. He is the, by far, number one choice. I Bill Benner is the number two choice. Everybody ooh. wants. Well, I've done that. <laughs> and the two hours don't go by quickly, trust me. Just listen to the Moody Blues the whole time? <laughs> yes. Well, he's, he's the Moody but I converted him over to the Dave Matthews band, so. You're responsible for that? Yes. Very much so.
Well, Bill, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, you're hearing the voice of, of two people who love you and think <laughs> the absolute world of you. You've been a huge friend to me and mentor and an absolutely delightful uh, lunch date all these years. <laughs> You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been David Benner, formerly of the Indianapolis Star, but he has been Director of Media Relations for the Indiana Pacers for more than 25 years. Thank you so much, David. I enjoyed it. It was a blast. I really appreciate the time, and we're all rooting like crazy for you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Don't forget my cookies. I promise. Danielle Shockey, I'm calling you next. (laughs) Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. 